Demonetization, a balance sheet is the topic on which I have been requested to talk today. When this announcement came, the New Indian Express newspaper in the south, which is the cousin of the Indian newspaper here, but a very different cousin, it asked me how to headline this. I said, you call it financial poker. You know, when the poker and blast was executed, it was executed with as much secrecy with which demonetization was executed. And it produced precisely the kind of consequences which we are facing within and criticism outside. Technic technological sanctions, financial sanctions, this country has been ruined. This was the kind of verdict that the intellectuals and economists and uh, foreign uh, thinkers and uh, strategists described the poker and blast as the end of India's acceptability as a country of Buddha and Gandhi. This is what uh, uh, Bill Clinton said. A country of Buddha and Gandhi has done this. So my thought at that time was, we have always been a country of Buddha and Gandhi, but we were never respected or accepted or never feared. Pokhran was a paradigm shift for the country. But to understand that it was a paradigm shift, it took a decade to understand. Because these things make such an impact on the people to absorb its effect and psychologically internalize it, analyze it, and to measure its worth and what you call as the balance sheet in, in the terminology of an accountant, it takes a decade. The demonetization was no less in the financial sense of the term. And in fact, in the security aspect of India also, it has a very, very major contribution to make. I will try to put together my ideas, which are very uh, vast and critical, and some of them have never been actually brought into the public domain in the discourse. Because of the polarization which has taken place, mostly on political uh, perspective. No. The story of demonetization did not commence on the 8th of November. You must understand. Sir, 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 Unless you go back in time to understand the background of the demonetization. Of course, demonetization has much to do with black money. It has to do with corruption. It has to do with the security of India. All this is, in a way, though not very well debated and discoursed, they have all been at least flagged in the public debate. But what has not come into the public debate is the most critical aspect of demonetization, which I will deal with first, before getting into other aspects. You know, Dr. Manmohan Singh described demonetization as a monumental mismanagement of the economy. Of course, in that speech, I would have very much liked him as a student of economics to say how and why and cite at least one number except a speculative 2% reduction which he saw in the GDP of India, for which also he didn't give any basis. Nobody gave any basis for the reduction in the GDP that may come. There may be a 5% reduction in GDP also, but how did he get 1% reduction in GDP? I did not know. Everything is speculation. But he described this as a monumental mismanagement of the economy. But I am going to present to you and make good that it is a correction for the monumental mismanagement of the economy from the year 2004 I am not making an allegation, I am not making a charge, I am making a case and I will convince everybody in the audience. I know all of you are very intelligent people, you can't be fooled into believing what I say. But I am going to prove to you how it is a correction to the monumental mismanagement of the economy which took place from 2004, I mark the date. And if it had not been done now, it would have been undoable forever. 
It could have been done more easily seven years back, five years back. It has been done with great difficulty and a great risk by the only person who could probably have taken this decision. And it would be undoable in future. I am going to make good all these points. Now I will take you to 1999 to 2004, when a very different dispensation was in power. You look at the economic data of that period. The five-year period of the NDA achieved a growth rate of 5.5%, nothing great, an average growth rate. And inflation was 4.6% below the what is the targeted rate as it is called. And in every sense of the term, there was stability and consolidation in the economy. You know what is the amount of jobs that this five-year rule produced? 60 million jobs. 1.2 million jobs every year they added. And that was the period when the largest amount of number of people were lifted out of the poverty line. But this is not described as the best period of the Indian economy. What is described as the best period of the Indian economy, high growth part of the Indian economy, which the world praised, economies praised, Wall Street Journal praised, Paul Krugman praised, is the next six years. Look at what happened in this period. The GDP growth rate was 8.4%. Inflation was higher, 6.5%. You know what was the jobs generated in the six year period? 2.7 million. This is the highest growth rate of India. The world price. India was looked upon as a rising economic power all through the top line, statistics, data. How is it that an economy which grows at 8.4% is able to yield only 2.7 million jobs in six years? as compared to an economy which grew at 5.5% and yielded 60 million jobs. Nobody asked this question, nobody analyzed it, they just said it is jobless growth. How did jobless growth come? It is a matter for inquiry, it must have been investigated by intellectuals, economists, column writers, policy makers, researchers. But we were just told no, it is jobless growth. Growth was there but it is jobless. I will reveal to you why it was jobless. This is best, this requires study. This requires rigorous work. You know, generally when growth takes place, money or supply also grows. Money supply growth in the five years of GDP uh, uh, India was 15.3%. And it was 18% in the UPA period of six years. There is nothing much, very small extent of growth over the NDA period and that may have perhaps resulted in the higher inflation. But where is the clue to growth without jobs? You know, where is the clue? In this six year period, the stock market, how it rose, in the five year period, how stock market rose? How asset prices rose in the NDA period and in the UPA period and how this entire growth picture changed is a matter for national debate. It is not being debated. I am going to tell you now. In the NDA period, the stock market rose by 32% in 5 years. Gold prices rose by 38% in 5 years. Land prices taking Chennai as the market which could not be very different in the rest of the country, 21%. The nominal GDP growth was 80%. All the asset prices were less than 80%. Which means there was no asset inflation at all. This is the picture in the first five year block, the NDA period. Now come to the next six year period. Stocks rose by 311%. Gold prices rose by 320%. Land prices rose 
rose from 200 percent to 2,000 percent. In 1999, there was no Gurgaon. It came into being later. The change in the real estate landscape of India. I am going to read out to you three deeds which took place in Bombay. <coughs> The NTC property in Bombay, the NTC property in Bombay grew from 2004 to 2010 by 300%. The buyer in 2005 sold that land in 2010 at 300% profit. Then Tucker family property which was bought in 2009 was sold in 2011 in two years at 100% profit. Then the best project, BEST, its land was bought in 2006 and sold in 2010 in four years at 495% profit. You understand this asset inflation? The economists here will testify that the entire crisis in the West took place because of asset inflation. That asset inflation took place because of lower rates of interest, huge money circulating all over, not finding place to invest, and they got invested in properties, in us, in gold, in, uh, in, in petroleum products, in, in commodities, and there was huge inflation which led to the collapse, but you were melt down, which the world barely escaped a Great Depression in the year 2008. It took place because of the banking system. But in India, the banking system was not responsible for this because the actual rise in the money stock was just 15.3% to 18% between 19, the first block of five years and the next block of six years. So this kind of increase in money supply could not have produced this kind of asset inflation. Then what produces this asset inflation? You know, there is a ratio which operates between cash with the public and the GDP. The cash with the public in India will be higher, naturally, because a very large part of the Indian economy is cash driven. And it will be cash driven. But there was money which was circulating more than the money needed for operating the normal economy. That's the point. Unless we zero in on that and what damage it caused to the economy and how we shifted the whole paradigm from the production to the financialization of the economy which led to huge asset inflation which is transformed into growth of 8.4 percent, we will never get at what is the compulsion for demonetization. My case is this demonetization is inevitable. It will not be doable after five years. That's what I'm going to tell you. In the year 1999, the cash to GDP ratio was 9.4%. It rose to 13% in the year 2007. It averages 12% today. This is cash to GDP ratio. But within the component of cash, the row of 500 rupee notes and 1000 rupee notes which was 34% in 2004, jumped to 79% in 2010, and to 87% today. It is this cash component, the extra money supply, more than necessary to operate the current economy, which began driving the property prices, certainly gold prices, and the stock prices. Many people will ask what is the correlation between cash economy and stocks in India. I will show you how the stock markets used to go up because of what is known as the participatory notes. Many of you may have heard about it. Participatory note is mostly the Havala money which sent from here and put as an associate investor of some FII without a person's identity being disclosed. The participatory note invested in India in the year 2004 was 68,000 crores. By 2007, 
it has become 3 lakh 80,000 crores. And when you banned the promissory notes, then he said you have to give the identity. Who are you? It came down to 71,000 crores the next year. You understand? The people who don't want to give the name were the ones who were invested. Once you were told you have to give the names, from 3.8 lakh crores, it went down to just 70,000 crores. So you can understand how it is just the black money from India through Hawala or through over-invoicing of imports and under-invoicing of exports which have got accumulated and draw the stock market. Stock markets went up by 311%. Gold prices went up by 320%. Gold prices never rose till 2008 in the world. It began rising only in 2006. Because dollar was considered to be more valuable than gold. When the dollar began weakening, gold prices began rising. One of the reasons for the rise in the gold prices are the women of India. You know, we buy one third of the world gold supply, or 30 percent of the world's gold supply. China buys another 30 percent. Both of us put together buy 60 percent of the world's gold. If Indian demand goes down by 50 percent, the world gold prices will go down by 60 percent. It is the Indian demand which sustains the world gold prices. Many people explain it the other way. World gold prices have gone up and that is why the Indian gold prices have gone up is untrue. It is reverse. So gold prices go up by 320%, property prices by 200 to 2000% and stock market by 311%. You compare it with the growth in the nominal GDP, the nominal GDP went up by 128%. 128% is the nominal growth in GDP, which is GDP measured at current prices. Huge asset inflation, which dogged the world and produced what is known as capital gains, much of which is untaxed in India because of the securities transaction tax, which is a very feeble tax on a huge market. This gain <coughs> reflected as GDP growth. Capital gains reflected as GDP growth. <coughs> and this growth also was produced by consumption, which is unrelated to production because if you had 100 crores worth of shares which you had bought at 20 crores, you tend to spend more. So you buy a paint for 50 lakh rupees. You buy a car for 3 crore rupees. These are all supposed to add to the GDP of India. The distorted consumption, the ostentatious consumption, the upper middle class consumption, which added to the GDP of the world between 2001 to 2007, that phenomenon was reflected in India, not because of bank funded capital, because of this cash, high denomination cash, much beyond the requirements of India, if we had maintained the same 9.4%, actually we should have gone down. You have so much of limited credit cards today. You have digital transactions. As compared to 1999, so the use of your cash must be coming down. But actually it went up. It was happening in the front of the Prime Minister of India, who was world acclaimed economist, it was happening in front of the finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram, who was elected as the best ever finance minister of India. <coughs> and it was happening in the presence of all the economists who were keenly observing India. You know what was the growth in the, number, the high denomination notes between 2004 and 2010? 51% every year. And taking into account the entire UPA period, it was 63% every year. Only one segment of the growth money is growing. It was happening right in front of you. You should have said hereafter, there is no question we want to withdraw this. You need not have had demonetization. We want this 500 rupee note and 1000 rupee note to be replaced in the next two years by 250 rupee notes, 200 rupee notes, 100 rupee notes. 
This entire tsunami of cash which went to drive the stocks, gold, and real estate would have been sucked out. You didn't do it. It was happening right in front of you. Can any one of these economists who are opposing the demonetization stand up and say, this kind of cash is required to operate the genuine economy? Property prices have become absolutely unaffordable for people who will live only in that locality. In Mailapur, where I live, 99% of the people would not like to leave this place because of the Kapali temple. They couldn't afford a flat in that place. Now, I had a discussion. Of course, I will come to it later, but I will introduce. Those who are making flats for 25 lakhs and less are extremely happy. Those who are making flats for 1 crore, 2 crore, 3 crore, they are all hurt. Because that 1 crore or 3 crore or 4 crore, 30 or 40 or 50 percent is black money. They will not be able to sell flats at that range. Those who are buying flats for 25 lakhs or 30 lakhs, they borrow money and they don't have cash to pay. The land prices are moderating. Actually, I had an email which I want to read out. I haven't brought here. It said, the Shiram group wanted to buy a property in the in the boat club area. Boat club area is one of the prime areas as good as well known as the Poets Gardens, which you know. So in the boat club, the property prices, <laughs> one ground of land was 11 crores before demonetization. You know what is the price today? 8 crores. No taker. This is what withdraws of this cash has done. Tell me, has anyone really analyzed and written this jobless growth continues even today? Government has changed. The structure of the economy has not changed. The quality of growth has not changed. Because the same cash operates. Whether the Prime Minister had all this in mind or not is a different point for me as someone who has been critically observing the economy of India. I feel that cash does very good job for the informal sector of which I have been the exponent. I am, I am surprised to see Dr. Manmohan Singh has begun talking about informal sector, small scale industries, cottage industries. Now they are talking. It is true that this cash money funds this, you know what, what interest rates? 60%, 90%, 120%, 365%, 1% a day. I have studied all this. I went to Ludhiana, Batala, Rajkot, Jamnagar, Morbi, right down to Tutukuri. I went to 42 industrial clusters. In four years, I virtually shut down my profession. Then only I understood India. You can never understand India by reading books, by writing theses. You have to actually go there. How many people know that the highest per capita income is generated in India? Not by Delhi, not by Bombay, not by Bangalore, not by Chennai, not by Hyderabad. It is a place called Murbi in Gujarat. They will not understand the word of English, but they understand economics. That's why when somebody asked me, what is your objection to Mr. Raghuram Rajan? I said he would have made a very good governor or the chief of federal reserve system because he understood America. He didn't understand India. When Mahatma Gandhi came back to India, Gopal Krishna Gokhale told him, yes, you have been in India, but you have also been away from India. You better travel through the India, through India for one whole year and never talk about anything. Afterwards, you make up your mind. Afterwards, he came, removed his coat, pants, suit, everything, and wear a mundu, he communicated to the people of India. A Mahatma Gandhi with pants, suit, tie, could never have made an impact. That is what your association with the people, your knowledge, their problems, their difficulties. I know all this, but 
But the answer is not to allow this cash economy to continue. The answer is to find an alternative. That is why this Mudra bank system was brought in as opposed to Bengal Reserve Bank. You must know the background. The government wanted this informal funding to be transformed into formal funding to formal and the informal sector for which they brought the Mudra Bank. The Reserve Bank objected to it and did not allow it. How many economists supported Mudra Bank, tell me? How many bankers supported? How many financial analysts supported? So I find there is a the discourse in India is so shallow, is so political, is so polarized, it is so you, you, me, me, that the real crux, the profoundness of the issue gets completely lost. You know, as I said, from 1.4 lakh crores in the year 2004, this high denomination notes have gone to 14.5 lakh crores in the year 2016. If this trend continues in 2020, it will be 30 lakh crores, which government can act against. Who says it is an option? It is inevitable. Otherwise you can allow this status quo to go on. Everybody making ultimately when the collapse comes, there will not be any public order in this country. There will be a collapse. Tell me, should this not be the intellectual, rigorous intellectual debate in this country? The debate, so long as it is centered in Delhi, will never touch truth, according to me. Delhi pervades perverted thoughts to the country. I am very sorry to say this. So my feeling is that basically the monumental mismanagement of the economy between 2004 and 2010 particularly is sought to be corrected now. If this is not monumental mismanagement of the economy, I would like Dr. Manmohan Singh to answer this. I have not spoken to you like this. I have written an article along these lines, putting all these facts and more facts in the Hindu in rejoinder to Manmohan Singh, which will appear tomorrow. <coughs> Economics is rigorous thinking. Going into figures, interpreting it, reading history, collating <laughs> situations. Nothing. People are standing in queue. I will come to it later. So the quadrangular relationship between gold, real estate, stocks and cash. Black cash generates black wealth. Now black wealth has been generated. If you withdraw the black cash, the black portion of the black wealth will disappear. For example, you know, real estate property prices have gone. Everybody has bought the property thinking that if I sell it tomorrow, this property will get me 3 crore in check and 2 crores in cash. These 2 crores in cash has disappeared. Many people ask, after all this money is lodged in properties. Black money is in properties. Unless you withdraw the cash, how do you bring down the value of the black money part of the property? And so long as the status quo continues, the property deals will take place at the same See, many of you would have bought the properties, sold the properties also. You know, I know people who want to pay only by check or take only by check can never get a property or sell a property. Where is the debate? You know what is the gold prices today? From 30,000 per 10 grams, it is 28 per 28,000 per gram. There is no change in the international price. The Indian price has gone down because there is no cash to support it. So this withdrawal of the cash, black cash, will only bring down the 
level of black wealth operating. Money is after all wealth. Money transforms into wealth. Wealth transforms into money. At some point you have to cut it. The only point at which you can cut it is the cash. This part is missing in the debate. So there is a contraction taking place. This contraction is deliberate. You know, if you ask the economists, market economists, they will say, crisis is inevitable in the capitalist system. When the crisis comes on its own, you say it is natural. Because economics always produces growth, crisis, and that is a correction, and then you begin growing again. Here is a correction ahead of the crisis. This is to avoid the crisis. This correction is deliberate, you can control this. 2008 meltdown was uncontrollable because no one had the planning to control it. Everybody ran helter skelter. But here you are planning a contraction. This is something unheard of. You see, no other country has done it. Yes, no other country has done it. I will give you an example. <coughs> Sorry if you are exceeding my time, please tell me. <coughs> You know, in the year 1994, 93, 94, Yugoslavia and Russia had the same problem. Russia two years earlier, Yugoslavia two years later. The running rate of inflation in Yugoslavia was a 2 million percentage point, which was higher than the inflation rate in the post war Germany. So, one very powerful nationalist was in power, Milosevic. And the World Bank told him that uh, you accept this condition, you accept this condition, you accept this condition, otherwise we will not give you structural adjustment. So that man couldn't, he said, unless I want to destroy this country, I will not accept it. So he approached an economist who was a 90-year-old man called Dragoslav Avromek. He was a disciple of Aramindo and he was in Geneva. So he ran him up and asked him, See, I am being asked to sell my country. Dragoslav said, I will give you a solution if you have the courage to adopt the solution. You know what was the solution? There was a run on the Yugoslavian dinar. People did not want the dinar, they wanted the Daesh mark, on which they had a huge Daesh mark for any change reserves. So they said, we want only Daesh mark. In our day-to-day -day transactions, let us begin saying, I, won't, I don't want to be, I want dollar. This was the kind of situation. So Dragoslav said, I will advise you one thing. You have for $24 billion foreign exchange reserve. You create a second dinar, which is convertible. The first dinar is not convertible. All that the people today need is confidence. This is psychological approach to economics. So he said, you create a second dinar and say it will be converted at market rate. Then he issued the second dinar, all the economists, World Bank included, they said if you issue the second dinar, people will convert their dinar into Daesh mark, take the money away. You know what happened? In three weeks, the two million percentage point inflation came down to less than 10% single digit. Foreign exchange reserves in three months went up by 45%. People who had kept money outside brought it back. Economist magazine waited for one year for the scheme to collapse. When it did not collapse, they came out with a front page story, the miracle in Yugoslavia. You know, a country cannot think for itself. It has to depend on Paul Krugman. It has to depend on some Paulson. You know, we have ceased to be original thinkers. Indian problems are different. We have our own way of doing our economics. So we need our own solutions. This country is so dependent. In fact, two channels interviewed me today. Sir, economist has said this. This person has said this. I said, they don't understand India. Even Indian economists do not understand India. How do you expect the economist the editor to understand India? You know, we as a country have become so least robust in our intellectual discourse. Narendra Modi is not an economist, but he understands the people of India, I think. Today, 
the i don't want to mention the name of the channel the interviewer told me sir i went to four districts in up everywhere people are having problems but they say one thing sir this is the correct thing to The economists do not agree it is the correct thing to do. The people of India agree it is the correct thing to do. Tell me, my assessment is some 25 crore people would have stood in queue in the last 40 days. Is that correct or not? Is it a wrong estimate? 25 crore people would have stood in queue or not? Take it at 25 crore. Has there any skirmish, any problem? You ask this kind of people to stand in queue, if they do not like it, if they do not approve of it, if they do not understand it, if they do not feel it is for the right thing, this country would have been up in flames, including the Supreme Court. Everybody thought there would be riots, or they wanted the riots. <laughs> People of India, it requires a sociological study. How people stood in queue six hours, seven hours. 103 people have died in queue. In fact, I made a calculation. They are very talking and heartless. I made a small calculation. How many people died in a day? Suri Prakash was the man who put me on this criminal enterprise. <laughs> I made a study. If out of one crore people, how many people die outside hospital and without accidents? That number is more than the number of people who stood in the queue. This is normally also take place. Because of the queue, because of the demonetization, Narendra Modi has caused all these things. Can you believe? That a country should debate an issue like this when 25 crore people stand in queue. When one fifth of the country stands in queue, one fifth of the deaths will take place in the queue only. <laughs> there are many points. I will just, because this is the most important point, the next important point I will 14.5 lakh crores in the hands of the people. Very little, 250,000 rupees, uh, 50,000 crores is only in the hands of the bank, a quarter lakh of crores. Out of 17 lakh crores, the balance money is with the people. So, this is also doing good work. Of course, it is doing bad work also. If a very large part of this money comes into the banking system, now, if, uh, now somebody asked me, if you have all the money comes in, don't you think this demonetization is a success? I said, I cannot understand. If all the money comes into the banking system, that is the success of demonetization. That how much of it is black money, how people have been over to put black money in different ways, that is for the system to detect. It can, in the normal course also it happens. Let us assume somebody puts 5 crore rupees in the names of 500 people and escapes taxation. This can happen even without demonetization. This is for the government to find out. Now you have got an opportunity to find out. Now you have got the technology to find out. Now you have put together a team to find out. So how much is black money is a matter left to do the competence, skill and also the honesty of the income tax department to unearth what is the black money involved in this. But you cannot say that if all the money is coming to the system, the system is, is a failure. Actually, it's a success. Unrecorded, unmonitored cash roaming in the economy is now getting recorded in the names of these 25 lakh people. What else? Most important development in the history of India. It has never happened. Once this money comes in, of course, Mr. Vivek Gadra is there, I should not be exceeding my limits in talking about economics. But I have been a consistent student of economics for 40 years. Many professors have stopped reading economics. I continue to read economics as a student. So I have the liberty of saying this. 
You know what is the amount of bank deposits we have today? 96 lakh crores. 96 lakh crores is the bank deposit, out of which some 60 lakh crores is lent to business. Another 20, 25 lakh crores is lent to different governments uh, by way of purchasing their securities and all that. You know what is the cash base for this? The maximum cash available is 17 lakh crores, out of which the Reserve Bank has said one third of the 500 rupee notes and two thirds of the 1000 rupee notes, once they move on to the banking system, they don't come back to the banking system, this amounts to 6 lakh crores of rupees. You deduct the 6 lakh crores from 17 lakh crores, only 11 lakh crores go and come out of the banking system that has produced 96 lakh crores of deposit. This is what is known as fractional reserve banking system by which the bank efficiently multiplies money and gives credit to the system. This 10 lakh additional, 10 lakh crores of additional money if it's get into the banking system. Once people say it is my white money, they are not going to misuse that money. They will save it. They will. This 10 lakhs will transform into 50 lakh, 60 lakh crores of money. That is what will bring down the rate of interest, not just a 10 lakh rupee deposit, 10 lakh crores of deposit. When this multiplies, then the interest rates will come down and inflation will come down. Then will come the funding of small and medium industries. Otherwise, you ask the bank to lend. The banks do not have money to lend. So this, is, this aspect is completely missing in the debate. Cash on hand versus cash in bank. It's a miracle the banking system does. In fact, the Bank of England produced a report about a year back. 97% of the money circulating in the economy is created by banks. <clears throat> Completely missing in the debate. That if the money comes into the banking system, demonetization is a failure. Can you believe this? Actually, it comes into the banking system. What effect it produces is the most important effect of the demonetization. I can go on. It's a huge topic. I will conclude with a very important aspect. You know, Mr. Chidambaram said this fake money which is circulating is just 400 crores. Of course, it is not 400 crores. It was 400 crores when he was the Home Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the estimate was. Nobody knows what is the estimate. The, all the intelligence agencies put together have made an estimate. It's about five to six thousand crores. Of our four hundred crores or five to six thousand crores out of fourteen lakh fifty thousand crores, <coughs> it's just nothing. So I asked a question: How much did the Bombay terror cost for the terrorists? You know what is the estimate? I will give you two estimates. One estimate was by two foreign authors in a book called The Siege, Adrian Levy and Cathy Scott. They said it cost the LED only 25 lakhs, $40,000. Then an estimate was done by uh, the Institute of uh, the uh, Department of Strategic Studies in Kurunanak University in Chennai. He said, no, it is not 25 lakhs, it is 2.5 crores. So it is 10 times more. But you know what is the damage it caused to the economy? According to the Asian Economic Institute study, the overall cost of the Bombay blast was $100 billion, 6.6 lakh crores by spending 25 lakhs or 2.5 crores. This is how the terrorists I don't think this is, the story is the same everywhere. The US embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, in which 200 people were killed and 200 were injured, it cost only $50,000. US coal attack in October 2000, 
in which 17 people died and 39 people were injured, 10,000 dollars. 2002 Bali bombing, in which 200 people died and 200 people were injured, 50,000 dollars. Marriott bombing in 2004, 266 people injured, 54 died, 30,000 dollars. Istanbul attack, 40,000 dollars. Attack on Madrid, $10,000, it cost a debt of $202,000. Now, you know 9-11 attack, how much it cost? And how much damage it cost? It just cost them $500,000. And the direct cost to US was <coughs> 3.3, direct and indirect cost put together was 3.3 trillion dollars. Now, Chandra says, what is, there is nothing. Chandra says, no, 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 just 400 crores. Imagine what 400 crores cannot do. I mean, the former Home Minister of India saying this, and the entire media lapping it up, and not questioning him, gentlemen, 25 lakhs could cause this kind of damage. 400 crores, how much it can cost? You compare 500 rupee note in the hands of the terrorist and 500 rupee note in the hands of the general witch, the same. <laughs> <laughs> the shallowness of the debate is amazing. And I am very happy that DIF gave me an opportunity to talk to some of the best minds in Delhi. Otherwise, you will all be looking at the only the same television. <laughs> <laughs> so, opinion making in India has been highly skewed. But for the determination of this one person who has decided, come, whatever the criticism, I will do this. This entire scheme would never have happened would never be allowed to happen. <coughs> A very different India is emerging. I will just read out one WhatsApp which I got from one of my very rich friends. <laughs> See, these are people who go in a, in a weekend and say, come on, burn some 25 lakhs, 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs. <coughs> what they have spent for, they don't know. They don't get anything else to do. <laughs> So that man sent me an SMS, uh, WhatsApp, I'm going to read it out. Because very, very educative WhatsApp, which is true of the entire country. It's amazing how a sense of contentment has settled in so suddenly. Many people asked, why not you issue advertisements to people and say that you should increase the digital payment, bank payment, and create uh, the necessary infrastructure and then do this. In this country, nobody will do anything by persuasion. This is <laughs> <laughs> so the sense of contentment has sent it to the man suddenly, not out of any enlightenment. This is because of what happened on the 8th of November. My shopaholic mind has suddenly turned to no shopping mode. <laughs> Clothes and shoes seem unimportant. <laughs> Saving legal tender for basic needs takes the forefront. The quiet seems to be peaceful. Yes, we are re as a country we are rebooting and I am enjoying being part of this change. Next sentence is very important. With money, there is always uh, an urge to run, to go and loiter in markets, buying things which we don't need most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I have known a friend who went, because he had excess money, he didn't know what to do. He went and bought a painting for 50 lakhs. I asked him, what is this painting? There are only seven lines like this. <laughs> and he began giving a big explanation for that, as if it is some Upanishad which is being explained. <laughs> and then he put the painting and invited some 300 people and spent another 10 lakhs to see that painting. 
Let me shoot Jack for one today. It's over. That kind of irresponsible, heartless spending is over. You know, this is going to bring about a huge change. Just like Pokhran brought about the changes, which were unimaginable. Who would have thought America would look at India? If you had not exploded the atom bomb, they would not have looked at you. I tell you, in the year 1972, <coughs> Henry Kissinger took a secret flight from Karachi because he thought they were the people who will keep the American secrets <coughs> close to the heart, which they did. That is how America believed Pakistan, because they could be part of the criminal enterprise of America. So he went and landed in Beijing, waiting for an appointment with Chowanwai, not knowing whether he will give him an appointment or not. This was 1972. And between 1957 and 1960, three crore people died in China out of hunger. There was nothing but hunger and poverty in China. Then Kissinger made that secret visit, waiting for an appointment. He was, he didn't know whether he will get an appointment or he will be humiliated. Of course, he met him and then met also. You must read that book, Diplomacy. It's a very good book. He says, why did he go there? It is only because China had atom bomb in its hands. The world respects power. The world respects strength. That is why the post poker in India is a paradigm shift. Likewise, this financial poker, in my view, is a paradigm shift, but it requires a very different mind to understand this, articulate this, express this, make the people understand, make even the system understand. 